Today, uh, from our lectionary readings, we will look at Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter 3, this morning. So if you could open your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 3, and we will read verses 14 through 21. We'll hear this prayer of the Apostle Paul for the saints. Uh, before we do so, let us go to our God in prayer ourselves and ask for his blessing. Our Father, we come before you this morning with gratitude that this word has been preserved by your power and that what we have before us is unshakable. So, Father, we pray that this morning we would also be made secure by truth, not only in our minds, but in our hearts, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that, that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thus far, the reading of God's word, may he add his blessing to it, and we say amen. Okay, so now you may learn a lot about a person when you talk to them, but you learn what's in a man's heart when you hear him pray. When one prays sincerely, his deepest desires are revealed. And here, Paul wrote his heart down. The inspired apostle of God who wrote this prayer down, he, he did so so that the church in Ephesus and us in turn would know and hear the deepest desires of his heart for the people of God. So to whom and for whom does he pray? Again, Paul wrote and said, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. So Paul, here, he's praying to the Father. For the family. To the Father for the family. In verse 14, Paul, who was imprisoned and under house arrest, keep in mind, kneels to pray before the Father on behalf of the saints. And in verse 15, he prayed to the Father from whom the whole family of God derives its name, gets its name. And remember in Scripture, naming is an act of authority. Naming, it shows who you belong to when you've been named. So what family? Praise to the Father. What family is he referring to? Well, he's referring again to the saints, the believers in God throughout all of history, and here particularly those in Ephesus, uh, who have been adopted into God's family, those of the Lord, uh, those who belong to the Lord that are in the heavenly realms, those in heaven, as well as those who are on earth. And more specifically, note that Paul is, he shouldn't be understood here as referring to some general universal fatherhood 
um, speaking of all people everywhere all the time. People might say, oh, we're all brothers. We're all bro not, it's not that kind of thing. That, that's, that's not actually true. But given the surrounding context, if you read through Ephesians chapters 1 through 3 and through the rest of the letter, you'll rem be reminded that the family of God that Paul is praying for, he's talking about Jews and Gentiles who believe in Jesus Christ, who have come to faith, who have heard the gospel of Christ. Now Gentiles can be incorporated into to Israel and made full members of the household of God. And so, we consider this, to whom Paul prays to the Father, for whom, for both believing Jews and Gentiles. And so, but what does he pray for? Let's pick up at verse 16 again. Paul says, I pray that out of his, that is the Lord's, glorious riches, he, God, may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Notice, for Paul, what was uppermost in his mind and heart regarding this prayer. What did he make a priority when he prayed? Did he start out by asking that the saints in Ephesus would have good health? Did he start out by praying, asking God that their financial needs would be taken care of? Was it that they would have food on their table? Was it that they would have good marriages? Or maybe that they would have good jobs and that their kids would do okay? Uh, now we know that all of those things are important and we ought to pray for them and Paul does give instructions elsewhere regarding all of those things. But uh, let's pause and consider this for a moment. Is it possible to have good health, great wealth, food on the table, a good job, healthy kids, and still be an enemy of Christ? Yes, it is. Is it possible to have all these things and to not love Christ? It is. It was once said, if you have Christ, you have everything. If you have everything and you don't have Christ, you have nothing at all. Again, it's not that we shouldn't pray for these other things. But our love for the blessings that come from God must be properly ordered. If you only live as a Christian, if you live the Christian life just for the gifts and ignore the giver, you become an ingrate. And who actually you become one who actually despises God. Now Paul prayed that believers would be strengthened in power through the Spirit so that Christ, here's the priority, Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith. Paul prays that Christ would be welcome in the believer's inner being. Uh, that Christ would dwell there, he would tabernacle there, that he would be welcomed in, that man's heart would be hospitable to Christ. Not just, yeah, uh, you have someone over, they come in the house and uh, you let them in the door, but the vibe you're giving off, everybody knows you don't really want them there. It's not that kind of thing. Paul prayed that Christ would be honored, welcome into the heart, into the home, of your heart as one who deserves the greatest respect, love, and attention in your inner being. But Paul needs to pray because he knows that this kind of love, it's not automatic for sinners. And he knows that sinners won't actually appreciate the blessings of God until they understand God's love. Until one understands God's love, we really don't get it. We don't respond with the right kind of gratitude. Let's take a moment. Uh, how about this? Our third point, pride. And what else am I going to write? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, pride and prejudice. Anyone ever read the book? Watch the films? Yeah, okay. So do you remember in Pride and Prejudice, now I know my kids will be quick to criticize me here, especially my daughters, they know this inside and out. So dad's trying to tell us about Pride and Prejudice, oh boy. Let's see what happens because there's, 
been many times when we've watched the film and Dad was sleeping <laughs> on the couch. I'll do my best. Do you remember in Pride and Prejudice how Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy's relationship eventually came together? At first, both had rejected the possibility of marriage for different reasons out of their own pride and preconceived notions. As the story unfolds, they both come to see the folly of their own misconceptions. One example, you remember, and I think this is helpful for us, when Elizabeth, thinking that Mr. Darcy cared more about his own status and wealth, uh, more than anything else, um, when Elizabeth read the letter that Mr. Darcy had sent to her explaining his actions. Remember this part? What happened? Got the letter from Mr. Darcy. She reads it. Her entire world began to flip, and her thoughts about him were forever changed. Many of the things she thought about Mr. Darcy in their past were rewritten, you might say put right, in her heart and in her mind. And it wasn't until Mr. Darcy's letter of revelation that she could see Mr. Darcy's good character. She needed to be enlightened by the truth. And once the truth was owned by her, when she believed it in her heart, she was able to see past her past history in relationship to Mr. Darcy in an entirely different light a light that eventually led them on the path of marriage and renewal. Well, in a way, I think that's what happens, we might say, when God, through the power of his word, gives us the spirit so that we might see, the, see Christ rightly. It changes our perspective on everything. We get God's letter, we read it, and the spirit's at work, and we can't see life the same way ever again. Consider this, um, heard this before, right? Christ, um, oh, sorry, we, we love him because he, he what? He first loved us. When writing to the Ephesians, again in chapter 2, uh, just if you remember, we won't read it now, but um, the whole thing. Um, for sinners, the reality is that things are far more complicated. Um, you know, Pride and Prejudice is an example, but sin is very, very complicated, causes much hardship, many misconceptions all the way through the heart about Christ. We as sinners by nature are not merely mistaken about some things that uh, 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 we've thought about, a few points regarding God. We as sinners are dead in trespasses and sins. But this is what ought to make the gospel of Christ that much more meaningful to us. God loved his chosen family so much, it says in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, uh, it says, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in transgressions, in chapter 2, verse 5. And this is similar what, to what Paul says in Romans chapter 5, where, where it reads, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, here's this power theme again. Remember, Paul is praying that God's power would be at work. Um, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We love him because he first loved us. Christ came to save a vow-breaking bride, one who was stained with the sins of uncleanness and impurity, a bride who was dead to him, a bride who needed to be saved and forgiven. A bride who, once saved, would then be restored, cleansed, and purified by his word so that she would be spotless, holy, and blameless on their wedding day. That is the church of Jesus Christ, the bride of Christ. And this is the reality that without a miracle, given that sinners are dead, without a miracle, without resurrection power, the bride of Christ, the people who were once dead in their trespasses and sins, cannot 
understand. They need to be awakened. They need to be brought to life. Paul has already acknowledged this, that this is essential if sinners are going to come to grips with the reality of what Christ has done for them, if Christ is going to make it into their hearts. A Christian, you might say, needs to be born again. Heard that before, right? Their entire way of viewing the past, present, and future is now changed by the Holy Spirit in the inner being, in the heart of man. And when we get to this point, by the grace of God, this revelation, this letter, now opens our eyes to a new world. And so Paul, again, is praying. Um, He wants the saints to know this and to grow in this truth. To know and grow the love of Christ. Again, when Paul prays, it's not only that Christians would know that uh, Christ has made them alive, but that their love in Christ would increase and grow all the more. Matthew Henry, he put it this way. He said, the more intimate, listen, listen closely, the more intimate acquaintance we have with Christ's love to us, the more our love will be drawn out to him and to those who are his for his sake. Consider that and listen again to Paul and the way he prays in verses 17 through 19. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and how long and how high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you might be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Love is both true knowledge of what God has done for you in Christ, and love for one another. The deeper, you might put it this way, the deeper your roots go down into the soil of Christ's love for you, the more you, the more your love will be drawn out and grow out to him and to to those who belong to him. And note this as well in verse 19. Paul prayed that the saints would know this love that surpasses knowledge. How do, what, what is he talking about? How can you know something that surpasses knowing? Right? He prays that the saints would not merely possess this intellectual knowledge, just the mere fact of something or, or considering you hear it, um, but that they would experience the ongoing growth of deep appreciation and understanding for God's love in Christ a love that uh, uh, surpasses knowledge, it's something, it's supernatural. It's not something we can do apart from God's power. Um, The last thing here uh, today The ocean, let's see, we'll do it this way. The ocean in a thimble that's already full. In order for this prayer of Paul to be answered, it would be entirely dependent on the outworking of God's power and grace in us. Paul prayed again, that God's people would have God's power working in their inner being, that he said, you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. This is like Paul praying for a thimble that is filled to the brim with water, and he asked God can, to somehow, can you get the ocean in there too? That's what I'm asking you. Put the ocean in there. Get it in there. Clearly something, again, not possible for man to accomplish. But he goes on and he says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. You see, we can't get the ocean of God's love in Christ into our 
symbol, the symbol of our own heart. We can't even imagine that. But God can. He can, and he does. He can do it. When Paul prayed, he said, according to his power that is at work within us, a power that God alone possesses. In Christ, through the Spirit, God can answer this prayer. And this leads Paul, he's, as he's writing this prayer, as this telescopic prayer, as it grows and it, it starts to shape, take shape, and it's, it's showing us his heart, he just bursts out in doxology, in praise of God at the end. To him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. He says, Amen. The God that I pray to, I know he can accomplish this prayer. It's no small thing, and I don't want you. <laughs> this is my prayer, and this should be our prayer as a church. To remember what Paul's priority was when he prayed, that we might know the love of Christ. The closer we get to Christ, the more real we become. That we know how to live, we know how to think, we show gratitude to Him. When we are able to see what He accomplished, the more we love Him. The more we will love one another. It's Christ living in you. Maybe this sounds like a platitude to you, but consider these things. Paul himself prayed. This was his priority, that Christ would be in your heart. It will help you order the rest of your life. You will know how to live as you grow in the love of Christ. Out from there, you will grow in all that you do, and you'll be able to accomplish it, accomplish it faithfully for God's sake. So let's pray. Father, in a time like our own, the world, its pleasures, the abundance, the creation, all these things that we have are truly, they're lovely. But above all, Lord, help us to order these blessings. Help us to grow in our love for, for, for the giver, that is you. Help us not to just be here for, for the gifts, but to remember where they come from. Help us to welcome Christ above all in our hearts. And may our love for him Increase day by day. Help us to read the story of salvation rightly with grateful hearts. And may we show it by our deeds to you and to one another. Amen.